I think Ellen needs very little introduction. Um, probably the world's most famous uh, sailor, if not, you know, and uh, uh, and I think perhaps what people haven't understood is for the last couple of years and and even beyond that, uh, Ellen has been a real pioneer and champion for the circular economy, uh, and to some extent even sort of coined the term in in I think public uh, forum and public debates, uh, and I think in particular has been using all of the her powers to look at how we shift behaviours as well as shifting some of the technology innovation and some of the models. So Ellen, with that, I will uh, not take up any more of your time. Um, just to remind people that the format is uh, Ellen will speak for about half an hour or so, and then we'll have Q&A. Just to remind you that uh, there is a chat function in, uh, if you look at the top of your screens, you can open the chat function. And uh, do post questions as we go. Uh, once we're ready, Jacob will feed those questions through to Ellen, uh, and we'll be able to pick those up and, and start a lively debate. So without further ado, Ellen, over to you. And again, thank you very much on behalf of David Rosenberg, uh, my co-chair, and I. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak to you. Um, it seems slightly strange doing that over video, but I shall do my best. Um, now, unlike many people who will have spoken to you, I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert in, in, a, in the economy, and I'm not an expert in this space at all. But my journey towards this has been really quite different. Um, my goal when I was four years old was quite literally to sail around the world. My goal was to go sailing, learn as much as I possibly could. But from the very first time I tried sailing, I had a goal fixed in my mind. And I think that's quite important when we relate that to the circular economy. Because when I first stepped into this space, I couldn't see what the goal was. I could see that we had some big challenges when it became to energy and, came to energy and materials. But I didn't know where we were trying to head for. And, and for me, in my life as that four-year-old sitting in a boat in the garden, I had an absolute goal. I had no idea how I would get to the stage of sailing around the world, but I knew that's what I was going to do. And that helped me to make every single decision in my life take me one step closer to that goal. And that goal happened. It happened twice, actually. In the year 2000, I raced around the world in a race called the Vendée Globe. Never raced around the world or sailed around the world before. And it took me to the most extraordinary places, racing in the middle of oceans, two and a half thousand miles away from the nearest landmass. The image you can see in front of you was my second round the world journey that was successful non-stop solo. And that was to try and be the fastest person ever to sail solo non-stop around the world. I left in the year 2004, and I completed that journey in the year 2005. And if you can imagine stepping into that world, you're leaving the dock for three months, and everything you have with you on that boat is what you will need for your survival. And you take with you the minimum. You take the minimum food, the minimum diesel for the generator, and it took 475 litres of diesel to take a sailing boat around the world. That diesel powered the autopilot that steered the boat, two computers which were always off when they weren't being used, and it powered the desalinator for salt water being turned into seawater. So you have with you all you have, and what you develop whilst you're at sea is the definition of the word finite. You realize that when you're two and a half thousand miles away from the nearest town, you realize what that word finite really means. And I was in my dream job. I never for one second thought I would step outside of sailing. It's all I wanted to do. I was at sea six months of every 12. But something, when I realized the definition of that word, something made me begin a new journey, which I had no idea where it was going to take me, which I had no experience in whatsoever. And that journey was to find out how do we use resources in our world. I was still sailing at the time, but I spent all of my spare time learning, talking to experts, reading documents, trying to discover how we use resources globally. And that learning took me to some extraordinary places. I read some documents that never 12 months earlier would I ever have picked up. You know, I learned about resources such as energy, coal, oil, gas, picking up the 2008 International Energy Agency report saying, we're not about to run out of oil, but we have about 40 years left in its executive summary. That really struck me. Because nobody knows do we have 40, 50, 60 years of oil. We're never really going to run out because there'll always be some somewhere. 
but the price gets more expensive. And that 40 years that was quoted was well inside my lifetime, I hope, which really made me think. Other places I went were coal-fired power stations to learn how we use coal. This photograph was taken in the burner of a coal-fired power station in the UK. And it was amazing to stand in this burner that goes to 2,000 degrees, look right up into the roof, 180 feet high, and realize that this was all built just to generate electricity, you know, to power the equipment that I'm using today to speak to you all. It was extraordinary. It taught me so much. And, you know, coal was a subject which was very close to my heart because my family were a family from the Midlands and they were involved in coal mining. In fact, the photo you can see right now is my great-grandfather. And my great-grandfather was a coal miner. He spent 50 years of his life under the ground. And when you see that photograph, you see a man from another era. That's not now. That's a long, long, long time before. And you kind of put it behind you because now in this country we virtually have no coal mining at all. But when I did my research and when I went to try and understand as much as I possibly could, you know, you realize that that's not actually that long ago because the photo you see now is me with my great-grandfather. And he was alive until I was 11 years old. And he told me all those stories. He told me the stories of the pit ponies underground. He told me the stories of the camaraderie between the miners underground. And, you know, and I remember that like it was yesterday. Yet on this journey, on this journey of learning, one of the places I went to was the World Coal Association. And I've spoken to many experts, but it struck me that, you know, there on the homepage of their website it said, we have about 118 years of coal left. And, you know, my great-grandfather, as I calculated on that day when I looked at the website, was born exactly 118 years before that day. And it just made me realize it's nothing. 118 years is nothing because I sat on his knee until I was 11 years old. And it made me realize the speed at which we're consuming resources was incredible. And it made me also make a decision that I never thought I'd make, and that was the decision to leave my absolute dream job of racing around the world behind me to focus on how do we use resources globally? How can our economy run in the long term? Which was the greatest challenge I'd ever even thought of, let alone even thought of getting involved with. And it's not just the energy of coals and, and you know, the oils and the gases. I realized it was also the materials, you know, basic materials. This 2008 report that the new scientist brought in said that, you know, when you look at the numbers, there are you know, 13 years left of indium, they were saying in 2008, in every LCD screen, a semiconductor. Then you've got copper, I think copper was 60, 59 of uranium, 40 of tin and zinc. Materials we use so readily actually were finite. No one makes them anymore. We only have so much of this stuff. And it just made me think so much. It made me think so much about how we use resources. And, you know, a year later as I was learning we had the GMO report come out that Jeremy Grantham brought out from GMO in the States. And these facts were, were really coming to the forefront that we've seen a century of price declines of basic commodities erased in just 10 years. And really, when you look at the speed that we're using these commodities, it's increasing and increasing and increasing. You know, and that line on that graph in front of you, that can't go vertical because they're finite materials. There are only so many of them. And really all that, in a world where we manufacture, where our economy is driven in a way where we take something out of the ground, we make something out of it, and then we throw it away. And to put things in perspective, you know, in front of you is the automobile industry. In the last 12 mon months, the average EU car manufacturer has seen a raw material price increase of 500 million euros, which is roughly half their operati operating profit just gone because those materials are ultimately finite and demand for them is getting greater and greater as countries develop all over the world. So the system, in a way, was not functioning, and that system was not functioning in many ways because the materials are finite and the world's population is increasing by a city the size of London about every 38 days. So if we have finite, finite materials and we have a growing population and we're using these materials at a faster and faster rate, what could the so solution look like? And what I found was you could characterize our current economy as, economy as a linear economy. So as I said, it's driven by taking something out of the ground, making something out of it, and throwing it away. If you're a car or washing machine manufacturer, you make your money when you sell a new machine. 
your business model relies on you selling a new machine or a new car. So actually, really, it's not in your interest for that machine to last for 20 years, because if it does, you won't sell enough to keep the business running. So your model relies on throughput all the time, that continual throughput. And when we created the foundation in September 2010, we had a, a year prior to that of looking for funding. And we spoke to many experts, we spoke to many CEOs, we spoke to many businesses. The foundation's funding comes entirely from the private sector. And what was interesting was when you spoke to businesses about their strategy in this you know, resource-constrained world, when we have these price increases, you know, more volatility than we've ever seen in prices in history, the strategy was to use a bit less, to do a bit less, to be more efficient with the use of resources. But it makes you think, if, you, if you're running a manufacturing industry and your goal is to use even 10% less material every year and use 10% less energy every year, you ask the question, in 10 years, are you making nothing with nothing? Is the goal to do less and less and less until you do nothing any longer? Is that going to be a long-term solution? And to me, as I went on this journey, that, that never fit, felt like a solution. It was absolutely vital in the transition to be efficient and to use less of what we have because it's this fast-flowing linear system. But the transition to what? And that was so important in my journey because as I spoke to experts, as I learned, I realized that actually there's some very different ways of looking at things, which mean that we don't end up here with a massive hole in the ground necessarily if we change the system. Our system is not set up to stop this happening. Our system is set up to run these materials through that linear system. But what if you think of that system differently? Like the CEO, Steph Cranendike, that makes industrial carpets. He didn't say, we want to make our carpets out of 5% or 10% less material every year. He said, we're going to change our system. We're going to change our system in its entirety because we want our carpets to be made to be made again. We want to be able to recover all the materials from our carpets. And in fact, we don't really want to sell them. We'd rather rent them to you because we want to guarantee that we're going to get them back. And when they come back, we'll disassemble them. We'll take the materials apart. We'll take the base off the yarn. The base will get melted down to the base of the next carpet. The yarn will go back to our yarn suppliers and be depolymerized and repolymerized and come back into our factory to be turned into the next carpet. And our goal by 2020 is to do that using entire, entirely renewable energy. And actually, that business model is very different. And that business model will work as well today as it will in a 1,000 years, because you're cycling those materials as life itself has done for billions of years. So it was that real shift, that business mentality, that shift in, we're not going to do things a little bit differently. We're going to change our system in its entirety. And we would call that the circular economy, where you redesign the entire system. So from its conception, from the moment that carpet is designed, from the moment those designers get the design brief, that carpet is designed for disassembly, you can recover the materials, and they can feed into the next carpet in the future. And if you take the example of a washing machine, you ask the question, what would that look like within a circular economy? Could the first line on that design brief be that it's designed for disassembly? Could you recover the materials? Then how does the manufacturer get the machine back? Does the manufacturer actually need to sell that machine? Or do you just pay per wash for a machine which will then be built in a very different way, in a way which will run in the long term, a way where it's, where it's repairable, remanufacturable, and the materials, at worst case scenario, at the end of the life of the machine, are recoverable? How would that make the account book of that company look? And how would that change your relationship with the manufacturer of that machine? The same could be asked for a car manufacturer. Do we need to buy all the raw materials in a car when we go and buy a car? Or do we just need to pay for the performance? Do we need to own the vehicle? Do we just need, do we just need the use of the material? When you think about the, the end of the life of a washing machine or a vehicle, you know, we don't want to keep them when they come to the end of their useful life with us. We don't want the materials. We pay to buy it, and then we pay to get rid of the vehicle. Or if we're lucky, we get a small amount of money back when it goes to the scrapyard. But it's never designed for that. It's never designed to fit in that cycle. And then what about the biological aspects? You know, when you look at a car or a washing machine, when you look at designing those materials to cycle, they're technical materials, metals, polymers, plastics. They need to be kept within a technical cycle so you can keep them within a cycle and put them into new products. It could be the same product, it could be something different. But what about biological materials? food waste, human waste, biological non-toxic packaging, 
Now, is our system today, our waste system as we call it, designed so that these products can cycle? Not really. Our system at the moment is entirely designed so that we can take some of these products and kind of deal with the waste, but we don't look at them fitting within a cycle at all. We never think about those materials sitting within a cycle. Some get biodigested, some get composted down at your local tip. But are they designed from the beginning to fit within a cycle? What would that whole world look like? And to put things in a more simpler context, this is one of the diagrams that we produced at the foundation showing the difference between that linear economy, which is predominantly driven by the use of fossil fuels, to that circular economy, which by intention is designed to cycle in the bi both biological and technical nutrient sector. But also, when you look at that economy, you find that you need less energy. If you remanufacture a product rather than manufacture it from scratch, actually you're talking about less energy demand. So it allows the shift to renewables. Take a remanufactured engine. That engine has 75% of the energy in it when it's first made from taking the raw material and turning it into the steel. If you remanufacture, suddenly you're only needing a fraction of the energy that you need for a brand new engine. So the system changes, the whole system. We're not just talking about design. We're talking about how the design of these products and materials and the use of them and business models and marketing fits within a very different but much larger system. And when we created the foundation in September 2010, we created it with the goal to accelerate the transition towards a circular economy. The foundation, when we set it up, and it's exactly the same today, chose to work in three key areas. We work in education through 14 to 19. We work in higher education. We also work in thought leadership and communication, and we work within business with the goal to accelerate that transition on different platforms. And actually, one thing that spans all of them, but predominantly concentrates within the thought leadership, is looking at the numbers. So we launched the foundation, we raised the funds we needed to kick the foundation off for three years, but we raised that with the model. But we didn't know what the model of the circular economy meant numbers-wise. So six months in to the creation of the foundation, we went to McKinsey, the management consultants, and we went to them with the idea of the circular economy, and we asked them three specific questions. Does the circular economy decouple growth from finite resources? Does the circular economy work for business? And does the circular economy work for the broader and wider economy? And so we first looked at the two different cycles. You have the main, your vert, what you see vertically on the slide is the current linear system. Then you have the technical cycle and you have the biological cycle. And you'll see there are many loops. What we're talking about is not just recycling technical materials and cycling biological materials, but in the technical cycle predominantly, what you're looking at is actually remanufacture, design for disassembly, being able to repair, remanufacture, maybe even resell as the tightest loop, looking at the whole system's change. The three questions we asked again, growth, decouple growth from finite resources, business and economy. So to go into answering those questions, what we found through studying five specific cases, which were the mobile phone, the smartphone, a light commercial vehicle, a washing machine, and also cotton as a material cascading multiple times through the economy. We looked at the first question, can we decouple growth from finite resources? And we looked at the mobile phone today, we looked at the mobile phone as it goes through the transition to scenario towards the advanced scenario of a circular economy. And what we found that was that, yes, you do start to decouple growth from finite resources. Your business as usual demand of those resources comes down. And as you can see in the graph, the higher curve is business as usual, and then the lower curve is actually the circular economy taking place, whereby you have a much lower demand for those raw materials because you're reselling the machine, you're remanufacturing the, the machine, you're decomponentizing the machine, and then finally you're taking the raw materials back out of the, of the machine and then using those to, to feed back into the next cycle. And even that was economically viable but the most value is to be gained in those inner loops where you're reselling, remanufacturing, and reforming those, those phones. And we picked a mobile phone and a smartphone as those two examples because we really felt that they were the hardest to make work. It was easier with a much bigger vehicle or a washing machine, but actually, what does it look like with a mobile phone? And it was economically viable. Question number two, does it work for business? And these are the five examples, looking at a mobile phone, smartphone, light commercial vehicle. And we found that, as you can see from the numbers, actually all were financially viable 
the transition to a circular economy worked in all five cases, even cotton as it cascaded through industries. And we found that the value was to be de derived really through doing four things. The inner circle, that reselling of the same product, actually there's a huge amount of value to be held there. You know, the grey market, what happens to the grey market, what happens to those goods? Can the same manufacturer resell those goods? Actually, if they don't sell them in the first place and, it's, and they pay for the performance of, that, of, the, of those goods or that machine, that starts to change things. So the inner cycle, cycling longer, circling longer. How can you keep those products within those inner loops for longer? So you resell, but then you look at the remanufacturing. So can you remanufacture the phone so it goes back out as new or the light like commercial vehicle? And then once you start to decomponentize it, can you design your new machines or your new phones so those components go in and they sit within that cycle? And then finally, you go to the outer loops where there's less value, but still significant value to be held. Then we have the cascaded use across industries. This works in both biological and technical materials. Can the material from one material flow into another industry or another product? And, and keeping it, and very importantly for the circular economy, at its highest value. You need to try and design those products so the materials within them can be maintained at their highest value, their highest quality for as long as possible. And in the, the case of cotton, which we looked at within this report, cotton was cascaded many times through, through the economy. So you'd have cotton in the form of jeans, then that cotton, cotton could become um, uh, insulation or it could become sound, um, a sound uh, material for the inside of a car door and then finally it gets biologically decomposed because from its design it was designed to be non-toxic and biodegradable so it has multiple uses throughout the economy and then finally as I touched on in that last one non-toxic not mixing up the materials either in the technical cycle but also when we look at the biological cycle designing things so there's no toxicity in there so the fertilizer that comes out at the end of the biological cycle and the biogas it's in its, its, its purest form. Just to go to the washing machine example, yes, this works for business. What did the numbers look like? Well, when we ran the report, we found that actually, if you look at your current low-end washing machine, so you know, your average washing machine that's designed for your um, relatively low-income family, designed to do 2,000 washes, that washing machine will cost you about 27 cents a wash because by definition the machine will break because the linear system of the manufacturer, especially coupled with the fact it's designed to be as cheap as possible with reason because it, they want to put the fewer materials in and they want it to be affordable, then that machine costs 27 cents a wash. If you look at a circular economy machine, it only costs 12 cents a wash and that's if you pay per wash. If you don't have to buy the material up front in the form of the machine, then actually your low-income family, rather than having to buy a machine which costs 27 cents a wash, could actually just pay 12 cents a wash per wash of that machine because the, the machine is designed to do 10,000 washes, designed not to break, it's designed to be repairable, it's designed to be remanufacturable, and ultimately the, the user, the, the manufacturer, can recover the materials from that machine at the end of the machine's life. So you're looking at changing the system. And you know that, those figures, that 12 cents per wash, was derived from a current high-end machine not a machine that was designed to be entirely uh, remanufacturable, repairable. And then when you think of the wider implications with regards to business models, for example, what would the relationship be with between the user of that washing machine and the manufacturer? If you're the user, you don't want it to break. If you're the manufacturer, you don't want it to break either. So you build a different machine. You end up with a more reliable, more resilient machine, which ultimately you never get stuck with at home when it's broken because it's not yours it gets swapped for one that does work. So you're looking at a very different system indeed. And take that to car manufacturing, the light commercial vehicle example showed that actually, if you take a light commercial vehicle from the field that's done 100,000 miles, the manufacturer buys that, literally buys that machine back, that vehicle back. They then can remanufacture the vehicle, changing the engine, the drive box, the, the drivetrain, the gearbox, the uh, transmission system, the tires, so it goes back out of the door of the factory looking like a new car with the same warranty as a new car. We worked out that you could do that by selling the car for half the cost of a new, new car, you could make three times the profit you would on a new car. So actually, not only is it only half the cost to buy a remanufactured vehicle for the user, but the manufacturer themselves end up making three times the profit. And that's obviously derived from the energy and material savings. And also the, the facility. So you're changing that entire system. And there are already people doing this today. 
When we looked at the wider economy, we looked at the, obviously, resource use, we looked at the material uses, we started to look at energy, and we discovered that actually the circular economy was worth for the EU economy alone 630 billion US dollars in the advanced scenario. And that was only based on a subset of 48.7% of manufacturing, so they're medium-lived, semi-complex goods, things that cycle in more than one year, but within less than 10 years. And that, was, that figure was only based on cycling 25% of the components or materials in that product just once per year. So it's a significant figure, much greater, obviously, in a global context, but also when you take it to the other sectors of the economy. That was only based on about 50% of the manufacturing economy. We looked at jobs as well. So what effect would this have on jobs? Well, we felt that there would be an impact on jobs in the early part of the extraction of the material from the ground because you're looking at decoupling that growth from finite materials. So you're looking at reducing the demand on mining. But however, when you look at remanufacturing, there are significant jobs involved. I was a couple of months ago over in France at the Renault remanufacturing plant where there are hundreds of people employed in that plant today remanufacturing engines and gearboxes and fuel pumps. And that remanufacturing plant has the parts coming out of it in the same box as a new engine, effectively. It's a genuine Renault part, and it has exactly the same warranty as a genuine Renault engine because it's been trialed, it's been tested, all the components have been tested. It's all been ultrasonically cleaned, and the only way that you can tell the difference between that remanufactured engine and a new one is literally the barcode. And they have to be barcoded within the factory so they can tell the difference between the new parts that go in and the remanufactured parts. So we do feel that there is some increase within employment and also more resilient employment. We also looked at the four key levers of the circular economy, very much focused on design and materials choice, the reverse cycle, reverse logistics. How do you get those back? How do you get those products back? Uh, business model, innovation, and also the enabling conditions. And note, the enabling conditions in the form of legislation and government intervention are the fourth in the list because when we looked at the numbers for the economic value of the circular economy, the 630 US billion US dollars was based on some governmental uh, changes, some taxation helping the circular economy happen, but the middle of the transition scenario wasn't. That was based on business as usual. Today, we can crack on and make this happen now. We don't need to wait for any government intervention. And why now? Because many people do say, so, you know, why the circular economy now? Why does it make sense now? This, you know, the idea has been around for a very long time. Why now? And I think there's several reasons. You've got resource constraints. So the center of price declines are raised in a decade, the volatility of, mater volatility of material prices, and the pure fact that manufacturers are finding it very difficult to produce affordable products with more expensive materials. Investment in the economy, we desperately need to unlock growth, especially within the EU. We need to be able to create growth, but ideally decoupling it from these ever-increasing prices of resources. We have the new consumer. We have people ready to accept different ways of having products. You know, one of the facts would be the, the number of males under the age of 40 in Germany who are buying new cars. Actually, it's decreasing quite quickly because do we actually need to own the car? Do we lease the car? How do we think about the use that we have of these products and, and resources that are available to us? And then the enabling technologies, the fact that we can now have zip car, we can have street car, we can track products and devices, which we couldn't do even 10 years ago, allowing us to use these products in a different way. Could you paper wash it on a washing machine many, many years ago? Not as easily as you can today. It can all be tracked online at a distance. So the world really is changing. And who's doing this out there today? Well, we have Michelin tires. Michelin over in the US, if you're a commercial customer and you have a, a lorry fleet and you work with Michelin, you won't buy the tires. You'll pay per mile for road miles of the tires. Michelin own them. They change them when they need changing. They therefore build the best tire they possibly can that will do the best number of miles that they possibly can. Caterpillar reman engines. The engine is designed so it can be remanufacturable. So when it reaches a certain number of, reaches a certain number of hours, that engine can come back into the factory, and rather than rebore the engine, which can only be done a few times, they take a sheet out that sits around the piston, and that sheave can be melted down, turned into a new one, and a new sheave gets dropped in, saving you remanufacturing the entire engine. Just part of it's been designed, so the engine can then go back out of the factory without ultimately two or three cycles down the road having to be broken up into the raw steel and then turned into a brand new engine. 
You have Renault with their new electric vehicles. This image shows their electric vehicles. You don't buy the battery, you lease it. The battery is the most expensive component of that vehicle, therefore you lease the battery. And actually, do we need to own all the lithium? Not really. Um, when it gets to the end of its life, do we need to buy a new one? Not really, because actually you're just leasing it. They'll always make sure there's a decent battery in that vehicle. And also, Renault's remanufacturing plant just outside Paris shows that actually there's a 200 million euro business there from taking, and what Renault do today is the broken engines from their whole network, remanufacturing them, and then selling them out of that factory. It's a very, very different concept than taking that initial engine for the first time from raw materials. And the circular economy isn't to say that you have to have the same engine and run it through the economy five or six times, because things move on. You know, engines move on, technology moves on, the world moves on. But what it means is if you've designed that engine to be remanufacturable and disassemblable from the outset, then when you get that engine back and you need to upgrade that engine, you have the materials then you can recover the materials, you can put them into the next engine, and in fact design the next, en next engine around them. So you're able to reuse those materials in a cycle, whatever they become in the future. Ricoh printers and photocopiers, I was at their remanufacturing plant up in Telford in the UK just a few weeks ago. They take a printer that's been out, comes back into the factory, it gets ultrasonically cleaned, it gets its keypad replaced, the software's upgraded, the machine is all sprayed up. It leaves the factory with exactly the same warranty as a brand new photocopier, but at 70% of the cost of a brand new photocopier, doing exactly the same job. And the manufacturer, Rico, makes significantly more, pro more profit on that product because they're not buying those raw materials again. So both win. It's a win-win situation when you've redesigned the product. O2, the latest uh, commercial tariff. By the way, you don't own the phone. We do. Best tariff. You don't really need to own the phone because at the end of its life, that phone can go out to someone else or it can be taken apart and remanufactured. And people are doing this now without the phones designed to be taken apart and remanufactured. They're doing it because those bones, phones have intrinsic value. And this has only started to happen over the last few years. Mizumo Mobile, classic example, 100,000 phones a month go through Mizumo Mobile and they're paying out 5 million for old phones every 30 days because they have a high market value. Puma, plastic bags designed to biodegrade. Those bags are designed that you can put them in water and they just disappear. And when we do work in education at the foundation, I'll walk into a classroom, I'll take a plastic bag and I'll hold it up and I'll say to the class, what's this? And they'll say, it's a plastic bag. And I'll take it, I'll put it in a glass of water, stir it around and drink it. And they can't believe that because they think of a plastic bag as being something which is harmful, which is you know, designed to be waste. But actually, if you redesign that, what can it look like? And it starts to open up the opportunities within the mind and show young people, as it does in a boardroom, just exactly what is possible. And when I think about the scale of the change to a circular economy, it's huge. You know, we have no idea what we're going to have to put in place to change the business model and the design and the products and the materials which sit amongst them. But I see this as a massive opportunity. It's a huge opportunity to redesign the system so that it really can run in the long term. And when I think about the scale of that and I make myself realize just how possible I feel that is, I think back to the life of my great-grandfather. You know, as you know, he was alive until I was 11 years old. And yet the year he was born, there were only 25 cars on the road in the entire world. When he was 15 years old, we flew for the first time in history. And he remembered that. And he talked to me about that when I was a small child myself. When he was 35 years old, the first computer, many said it wouldn't catch on, but actually it did. And just 20 years later, we had the microchip, of which there'll be hundreds of in this room here with me and with you there today. 20 years before he died, we had the mobile phone, a brilliant piece of kit, but it actually wasn't that mobile. But now it is. And now the whole infrastructure of countries has changed as a result of that technology. We don't need the fixed wires on the ground. We can use mobile technology. It's changed investments all over the world. And as my great-grandfather left this earth, the Internet arrived. And if ever there is a time in history when we can redesign the future and make it work, it's right now. Because any of us can have an idea anywhere in the world, and it can literally be shared globally within seconds. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Helen. Uh, truly inspiring presentation, and, and I think you've. Uh, yeah, I think we speak for everyone when I say that you, you've uh, 
you've approached this from a very sort of systemic uh, approach here, and I, I think you you and the foundation, uh, you know, pretty much has it all figured out. <laughs> now it's just for for business leaders to start uh, start act here, uh, and I think you've done a fantastic job in, in bringing the kind of theoretical cradle to cradle concepts into something that's very tangible and actionable. Uh, and, and I think that the, the report towards the circular economy is, is truly thought-provoking, uh, and I, I, I really encourage everyone to read it. Uh, so having that said, let's, let's move into the Q&A here. We've been receiving uh, quite a lot of questions. So I'll just fire away, and we we'll see how far, how far we get on my list here. So yep. the first one is uh, on consumer demand. Uh, mm -hmm. so so consumer demand is, is, true, is obviously going to be a key factor when the companies decide to pursue uh, a more circular uh, approach to their business. So do, do you have yeah. any thoughts ar around that? How can we engage uh, the end consumer? Well, it's, it's an interesting question. And when we work with business, we often ask these questions as to, you know, when is the time to make this happen? But we find that, you know, if you, if you for example, let's take the automobile industry, if you've seen your raw material prices increase in the last 12 months by 500 million euros and there is an option to change your business model whereby you can provide mobility in a different way that decouples your business model and your your profits your growth your your the functioning of your organization from the price of those raw materials then i think we're in a we're in a, a place in the economy where people are really looking at how that can happen another example would be b&q they're one of our other partners at the foundation they have you know quite famously in the UK, sold the 99p plastic bucket for many, many, many years. Now, the polymer price has gone up such that that bucket now costs £1.49. We're no longer in quite the same ballpark. And lots of people say, do we need a circle economy stamp or a cradle, cradle stamp on things so people understand? I think, yes, that helps. But when you look at the numbers, and you look at the numbers around a, you know, a, a light commercial vehicle or a washing machine, if you can have a better product at half the cost, in the case of the car, or at less than half the cost in the case of a washing machine through the system being different, then why wouldn't you? Do you need to know that's a circular economy car or washing machine, or do you just need to know that there's a better product that won't break on you, that you have a good relationship with the manufacturer for, that will cost you significantly less than the alternative, which today is, you know, is a low-end machine that's not designed for that in the case of the washing machine? You know, so I think there's a, there's a need for our economy to shift anyway. That, that's clear. We have you know, 3 billion new consumers coming online and raw material prices are continuing to increase and be very volatile. So there's a need to shift to something different. But actually, what we discovered through the economic report was that it was advantageous to both the manufacturer and the user of that product to shift towards this. So it's just a better deal for both parties. Okay, so we, I actually have a question here on that, the manufacturer's part of that, 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 that reply. So what, what did mm -hmm. you discover as being the, the, the key sort of cost drivers that we need to address and that we need to lower in order to scale this? So what, what, what in a circular business model are the big uh, cost drivers like, like reverse logistics or, or uh, you know, quality control or security? Or I think that um, there's a definite need for, and this is one of the first conversations we have with you know, the, the companies that we talk to about this is, if you're going to change the design of your product so that you can become more resilient from raw material prices, how do you get that product back? Because there's no point in redesigning a computer or a car and actually, there, you know, you redesign it all so all the materials can be recovered and then it disappears. I mean, there's, a, there's an advantage to the economy because ultimately somewhere down the line things will be recovered. But if you're trying to do that to make yourself more resilient, then actually you're not completing that loop. You need to be able to get that product back and use your knowledge and use your IP to take that apart and recover the materials so that, that that economic gain can be had by the company and ultimately also passed on to the consumer. So often what we discuss first with companies is it's not just the design, the design for disassembly and decomponentization and, and remanufacturing, but it's how do you change the business model so you can get those products back. Does it become a lease model? Does it become a performance model? Does a washing machine manufacturer end up but, you know, becoming a, effectively a, a, a service for the use of washing machines within the general public. Which other players come into play? Because there is a massive opportunity here for reverse logistics, for other companies to take on the decomponentization as well, um, to, to be processing the, you know, the current waste, which will never be waste in the future within a circular economy, because waste is designed out from the system. So who will be the third parties? You know, who will be collecting these, these products 
what will that system look like in the long term? So we often find that the, the reverse logistic question comes up quite quickly. But then there are other benefits which spring on from that, such as taking over the grey market that you're currently losing out to of your own product because actually you don't get them back and other people sell them on anyway. So there's a lot of conversations that go on in the, in the business model and reverse logistics space. Yeah, so on that um, sort of marketplace and and, uh, and and second sort of second cycle trade, I, I read somewhere that in in Sweden where I live, the big marketplace, the Craigslist of Sweden, if you like, uh, they, they trade goods uh, for an equivalent of seven percent of the entire GDP of the country, mm-hmm. uh, but it doesn't of course show up in the, in the official GDP figures. So so yeah. I, I get a sense that this market doesn't get enough attention or the attention that it should. So, so how can we sort of work with that policy side of, of the circular economy to push this market and uh, make it more attractive? Yeah, well, I, I think, um, you know, obviously as a foundation, we don't have all the answers. Um, one of our reasons for creating the economic report was to put some numbers to this. You know, what we unquestionably need within Europe at the moment is some growth to get ourselves out of the financial crisis. Now, no one can say that we'll grow forever, but there's a massive opportunity for growth within this sector through redesigning the system so that we can decouple that growth from finite resources. So one driver for changing the system and pushing this along for us is just pushing the numbers out there to show what the economic value of this really is. That, I'd say, is one. But also, as a result of that, as a result of having the numbers out there, because you know, no government wants to jump in with both feet saying, yeah, well, let's go for the circular economy, it's the way forward, it cycles materials, it works, without those numbers, which is one of the reasons we put the report together in the first place, be it a business or a government, they're not going to push this hard if they don't, you know, they don't understand the economic rationale behind it, as we didn't at the time. So I think that that was an important step for us as a foundation, because as a result, we're now sitting on the European Resource Efficiency Panel, together with um, the various commissioners from the EU and CEOs of really big companies, and we're looking at legislation, and we're looking at how can you change legislation to help to to move the shift towards a circular economy. So that's come as a result of the numbers and the economic drivers for making this happen. So I think it all kind of happens together as a process and moves along, but it can't happen fast enough. Mm. I have another uh, interesting policy question here. So someone is, is, is asking about how the taxation is supporting the circular economy, where we today tax labor very high and material yeah. consumption very low. So can you yeah. elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, well, we're, we're in the middle of a project with the EU at the moment looking at how we can help taxation accelerate the circular economy, and not just taxation, but also legislation. So how can you taxate and legislate to change things? But actually, we do uh, do work with a guy called Walter Stahl, who's based in Geneva. He probably was the founder of the whole idea of a circular economy before I was born, I think in 1976, which was the year I was born, Walter had already written papers on this subject, already looking at a different economy, and something he is very keen on is how you know, if you, you should be taxing non-renewable resources, but not taxing renewable resources, and he very much classes human labor as a renewable resource, and that we should be taxing those materials, not the people who are actually making the products, which would, by definition, shift the economy, the economy around. And, and that's actually being looked at and put into practice in the states of Florida and Texas in the U.S. So it's not just a, an idea, it's actually out there and it's starting to happen at the moment. Wow, that, that's, that's very interesting. So let's move on to a different topic here. I have a question on the leadership challenge. So, so there is clearly a, a tech technology and, and a business uh, model challenge, uh, but what about the leadership challenge? So how, how can we get business leaders to embrace the circular economy? Well, I think that's an interesting one. Um, I think when we first kicked off the foundation, we had those conversations with you know CEOs and COOs and CFOs looking at this as, as a model. Um, what we found was very interesting was that the, the, the narrative of the circular economy is about changing the way the business functions and indeed changing the bigger system. And from a business leadership perspective, it's actually quite... Um, quite likely when you stand on the stage and say this is where we're going that people will be with you what we're talking about here is the change in strategy the reason for the change in strategy is raw material prices and energy getting more expensive there's an economic opportunity there and we can see the reasons for doing it we can see the opportunity this is where we're going well we won't be there in five or ten years but this is where we're heading and when we get there guys this is going to work we'll have a resilient company and your jobs will be 
more secure than when they're at risk of the, you know, like the EU manu motor manufacturing sector at the moment. Is there's some massive issues because there's, you know, manufacturing's gone down and remanufacturing doesn't exist and raw material prices are going up. So actually, we're looking with a circular economy at a more resilient model. I think from a business leadership perspective, that's a very strong stance to have, saying this is where we're going. Not claiming you're there today, although some companies are progressing quite quickly along this route, but saying this is where we're headed. So I think this gives an extra lever to business leadership. I you know, very strongly felt when I first stepped into this space, which is you know, why I kind of rewound in this presentation a little bit to the beginning, was that when I first started learning about this and I learned about the challenges and the volatility of prices and the price increases, to, to stand on a stage and say, you know, the goal for our business guys is to use 10% less every year. It doesn't work. It doesn't mo motivate everyone. They realize there's a need. They realize why they have to do it, but it's not the end game. And I think if you can motivate your staff, your company, your suppliers, your supply chain about the end game, I think that's a very strong position within a business. Mm, so so what, what, what skills do a business need within the organization to be able to do this or to sort of understand this, uh, this topic? What we find when we work with businesses is actually that, you know, that there, there are areas where we need to skill up without question. Material science. Um, you know, reverse logistics, you're looking at shifting the system. But it's, it's, not, you know, it's not ultra complicated. It just relies on a shift in thinking as to what the strategy of that organization is. You know, you look at procurement teams. At the moment, most procurement teams for businesses are trying to procure the cheapest product. It's all about price. You're trying to procure the cheapest product that will do the job that you need. But, and that's, that, that's what they're, they're trained to do. That's what their job description says they need to do. It's about cutting costs within the business. But actually, if you kind of turn that on its head and you say to your procurement team, um, what, what we need is this job doing, but it's kind of up to you how it happens. So maybe you procure something which costs more up front, but actually over its entire life it costs less because it's remanufacturable at 5, 10, 15, 20 years. We only buy the materials once. Maybe actually you're not procuring... The, the, you know, you're not procuring the buying of an asset, you're procuring the service. And actually, if you're procuring a service, what service will you actually ask for? And it's, so all of these questions, it, it starts to change people's thinking. And we find that, you know, groups who've been absolutely in the linear economy, as you know, I was four years ago, suddenly start to see things in a very different way. They ask different questions, they procure differently, they look at this in a different way. And actually, it's often that unlocking of the idea that then unlocks the process that makes things happen. Now, it's not to say that everyone has the skills. We've, we, we know for sure, you know, in, in looking at National Grid, you know, right now they do not have young people leaving education with the right skills they need to rebuild the energy infrastructure of the UK over the next 10 years. It's just not happening. Those, those skills just aren't there. Um, so we do need more engineers. We do need more material scientists. We need systems thinkers, because actually through our education and our training, and hence people in roles within businesses, you tend to be quite siloed. You're in the finance department or you're in the logistics department, but actually here we're looking at you have to span multiple departments. It's a systems level change. So you have to look at the whole system as a whole within the organization and also in its wider context as well. Mm, interesting. So one specific question on that financial skill perspective, I guess. So how can a company calculate and forecast uh, a product's profit, profit across several life cycles. So how, how, how would you do that in practice? Do you have any models or are there any you know, frameworks or, or thoughts on this? Well, there are companies out there doing this already like Michelin tires and Rolls-Royce Power by the Hour or Rico remanufacturing the printers and photocopiers. So this, this is starting to happen, but it does look at accounting in a different way. You know, currently you devalue your assets within your account um, will that be the case in the future if you remanufacture? With you know, the renting model brings up many accounting questions as well. And you know, as a foundation, we don't have all the answers, but what we do know is there are companies out there doing this today, and they're being very successful at it. You know, they're they're growing market share very quickly, and they're taking a different tack. So all the answers aren't there for the circular economy, and all the challenges have certainly not been surmounted. But there is an opportunity there. It doesn't need to wait for massive legislation change. And one of the reasons we're progressing with the companies that we're working with these ideas as fast as possible is to find these barriers, is to try and overcome these barriers, to share ideas, and to look at how the processes can be broken down. Mm. So on these new uh, business models, there's one 
question here on product to service models and that uh, they have definitely gained a lot of interest uh, within for example car sharing and solution sales yeah. in ind industrial equipment so what do you yeah. see as the next sort of industry breakthrough uh, for these business models what do you see uh, ahead here i i think it's a, the, the the whole um the kind of collaborative consumption movement is is happening with the boris bikes in london the velib in paris the whiz car the zip car it's already happening i think with the, with the um, you know transport, it seems to be quite advanced, or there are elements that are quite advanced within transport, which are publicised, which people know about and, and indeed use, which is why they're growing and they're popping up in different cities around the world. I think what that's very collaborative. So a you know a zip car anyone could use, or a Velib in Paris anybody could use. I think when it comes to a product within your house. That's a bit different because it's not like you're saying to the whole street, come round to my house and use my washing machine. You have a very different relationship with the manufacturer of that machine who becomes the supplier of the machine and you then become the user of the machine. I think if it means that you can have the machine for less and the manufacturer makes more money with the machine, um, then that's a win-win situation, I think, and, and I think which, which evidently as a result of you know, the numbers that we saw in our report does stack up, then that's going to be a, a huge new area of growth for companies rather than being squeezed by these raw materials trying to keep that list, that linear system functioning. I think that's going to be a, a big next step. But there's also the whole biological cycle and the biological sector and how do you redesign that cycle so that human waste and food waste and packaging can sit within the biological cycle. That also is, is a, a huge opportunity as well. So I think there's, it's, it, there's a lot of opportunity out there and no one has all the answers yet. Yeah, interesting that you touch on, on food there, because there was actually a question, let me find it, on, on different industries and if if circular business models, uh, if they're mainly interesting in you know industries that use high valuable uh, non-renewable resources, or what, what would the business model look like, for example, for a food stuff uh, or a fast-moving consumer good where, where the material value is low and maybe there is an ex extensive use of, of, of uh, more bio-nutrients. Yeah. Well, in, in the technical report that we brought out for the World Economic Forum this year, we looked at the five categories, cotton being one of them as a biological material. Um, and in that study, the cascading of that material multiple times through industry did work as it was economically viable. So you could get multiple benefits from the same material, provided that it was designed correctly so that it didn't kind of pollute any of the levels on the way through and at the end could be biodigested and could create fertilizer and biogas and, you know, and effectively sit within that biological cycle. So we think this is a huge opportunity. We're doing more work on the biological cycle at the moment. Um, we don't have the same level of data as we do with the technical cycle that we've put together for the you know for WEF this year. So we are looking at that, but there does seem to be a massive opportunity there. You know, if you look at 50% of the world are fed using fertilizer dug from finite mines. If you think back to the presentation I saw Jeremy Grantham give in the inaugural European Resource Efficiency Platform meeting, when he talked about commodities and he talked about talked about bubbles and he talked about you know his study of the prices of these commodities over many years. And he, you know, he finished his presentation talking quite literally about food and farming and phosphorus and potassium. And actually, we really need this stuff for our survival. And when you look at how that could be recovered, you know, it's not to say that overnight we can replace chemical fertilizers with, you know, with our cycled materials. However, there is a massive opportunity to recover a lot more from what we, you know, the waste that we currently have, so that in fact it never becomes waste and everything goes back to fit within that cycle. Mm. So we're we're nearing the hour here. Uh, let's uh, let's do one more one more question, and then I'll leave the others here. So let's have a look. Oh, this is a good one. So, so if you if you are a business leader uh, and you want to start move towards a circular economy tomorrow, what's what's the first step? What's what's the first thing you do? I uh, I would train my staff to understand the opportunities of the model. Because once you unlock that different way of thinking, you see everything that needs doing within the organization. Now, that doesn't break down all the individual challenges, and it doesn't change the system. But if you get your company to understand this at the right level, and if they can see the opportunity, then they will know which barriers will need to be broken down, and they need the remit to do that. And just one example of this actually doesn't sit within business at all, but within education. 
we worked on materials for design and technology and all our educational materials, which is now 700 resources, which we've piloted and tested over the last two years, have now been disseminated at full scale in the UK with a team of field officers that take these materials to schools. So when we were piloting the design and technology material, we went and worked with many schools, one of which had a great teacher in there who was teaching his A-level student circular economy. Now, one of his students came up to him and he said, Sir, when I did my GCSEs, so his 16-year-old exams, I couldn't think of anything to design. You know, I love D&C, but everything was done. I couldn't think of anything to design. But now, now I've learned about the circular economy, everything I see I want to redesign. And all that happened in his head was a switch was flicked. And he suddenly saw this massive opportunity because everything needed redesigning. And that's what happens once this message gets through to people within the business and they have the remit, they have the opportunity, they're told, go for this. They think in an entirely different way. And I've seen teams shift from one space to another space just with their, their you know, minds open out and they look at the ways to solve the problems. Because they haven't all been solved right now. But you need the entire company on board because it's a systems level change. It's not just about you know, take, pick, taking one department and working with them. It's a different economic model. It's a different economic strategy. Okay. Uh, I, I certainly feel like I, I want to redesign everything sometimes. Uh, that's a good one. So uh, let's wrap up. I apologize to those who, who couldn't get their questions in. Uh, but yeah, this was, I think, definitely one of the most successful and interesting talks we've had yet. Very practical, very tangible. Uh, I'd say very sort of uh, very actionable. Uh, and I think that's that's very uh, yeah, that's a very rare skill in this space to be to be this 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 tangible. Uh, so. On behalf of myself and, and Quentin and Peter and David uh, and the whole task force, I'd like to thank you for, for having this presentation today and for taking the time. Uh, and yeah, we applaud everything uh, you do in the foundation and look forward to, to, to uh, seeing and hearing a lot more in the future. Thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you some, some of you at WEF. Thank you for coming online. Thank you, Ellen. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.